You mentioned sleep debt. Yeah. Talk to us about sleep debt, how it accumulates, and if people are listening today and they have sleep debt as you after you describe it, what can we begin to do? Is it again doubling down and making sleep a priority? So let's chat about a big picture. What is sleep debt? Well, uh, well, sleep debt is um, our our body needs says, for example, seven hours of sleep because a lot of studies around the world when they look at uh, what is the average number of hours people sleep and what are the comorbidities or diseases or even longevity, what they find is six and a half to seven and a half hours in adults, older adults. We're not talking about college students or high school students, older adults. That seems to be the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, people who sleep less, they have more comorbidities and people who, have, who also sleep more, maybe they have underlying conditions, that's why they're sleeping more, they also have other comorbidities. Right, you don't wanna be sleeping nine hours plus if you're not an adolescent, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. That's a sign that maybe something's going on, chronic fatigue, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. You wanna hit that sweet spot of those seven to eight hours. Yeah, so uh, a lot of people who uh, sleep less in the weekdays, say five to six hours or five hours, then they experience it, that their body actually keeps track of how many hours of sleep you have lost. So that by Friday or Saturday, you are so sleepy that you just want to catch up. When people say I'm catching up on my sleep, that's exactly what they're doing. They, their body has calculated and then it's telling them that, okay, so on Saturday, you got to sleep another four hours or five hours and they're catching up. And um, what happens is, so that's kind of what we say sleep debt. You have taken that debt against your regular sleep and you have to pay it back, pay it back to your body by sleeping extra. When we get older, then what happens is our bodies, the sleep debt calculator doesn't work very well. It actually doesn't remember how much debt we are accumulating. So mm. that means you can go with less sleep four or five days, but your brain is not re remembering, so you'll still end up sleeping less. And you think you're fine. And you think you're fine. So that's why <laughs> this is this is some some instances where you should not be listening to your body. <laughs> 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 if you know, if, you're, if your uh, smartwatch or smartphone is telling you you have been sleeping for five hours, and you know that you are sleeping for five hours every night, and then you got to work on it. Another reason why we also forget our body forgets sleep debt is when we um, overconsume caffeine. And this is something I have personally felt because you know and there are many times when I have to um, consume excess caffeine or maybe late afternoon coffee just to get through a grant deadline or a manuscript deadline or something else. And then, um, if I continue that habit in the weekend and also have a lot of uh, caffeine, then of course I'm sleeping less, six or less hours, and um, my brain doesn't remember that, that I'm having sleep debt. But the other way it shows up is I'm more hangry, I'm more irritable, I know that I cannot think clearly, and um, my overall productivity goes down. Mm. And I'm kind of struggling, and then I kind of blame myself. I blame people around me, and I'm thinking that okay, so for all of my problems, somebody else is re responsible. <laughs> or sure. I beat myself. Why I cannot get these things done? Uh, so a few years ago, I uh, did a simple experiment. I kind of do all types of experiments on myself. One is, <laughs> I said, okay, so between Thanksgiving and New Year, I will stop caffeine. All kind of. Uh, caffeine containing drinks. Um, coffee, green tea, Coffee, cetera, green tea, Diet, Diet Coke. Coke, Coke, anything that has coffee or caffeine, including uh, you know dark chocolate also has many flavonoids that can keep us sure. awake. And to my surprise, almost every night, the first few days I felt like I haven't slept for a month or so. My sleep <laughs> dead just kicked back in. And then I would fall so sleepy, I'll feel so sleepy by nine o'clock, it was really hard to stay awake past 9.30. And um, so that goes on for at least 15 to 30, 15 days to three weeks that I'm just sleeping like eight, Because nine you don't hours. have caffeine, you feel more sleepy is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, means first, my, first my body is actually has remembered my sleep right. debt and it's right. just saying, no, you got to pay. <laughs> you have a huge debt and you, have, you haven't paid for a long time. And then after two to three weeks, then I come to the equilibrium that I can actually sleep for seven hours. And that's when I realized, okay, so this is my 
normal circadian rhythm. This is your baseline. This is my baseline. But you got to do a little bit of a caffeine cleanse yeah. to reestablish that. To reestablish and also to know what our body, what my body needs. And essentially what my body needs is I should be going to bed between 10 and 11 and should be waking up between 6 and 7. That's what I figure out. Yeah. So this is the kind of stuff that everybody can do once in a while. Do an experiment. You are not going to die if you <laughs> stay away from coffee <laughs> for maybe in the weekend or for a week. Right. And we always talk about personalized health, personalized precision health, and all these um, fancy terms that we say. Whenever there is the word personalized, we have to keep in mind that more than half of that responsibility is on us mm. to try something, a new lifestyle. Um, try to figure out whether you can change the quality, quantity, or timing of your food, exercise, or sleep. And this is where one can actually try. And for older adults, it's uh, difficult because uh, as I said, even in experimental models, like for example, we can take little fruit flies, and this is not experiment in my lab, but other people have shown it. And the young fruit fly, if you keep them awake by putting them in a <laughs> rotating drum so that they cannot sleep, then uh, the next day when you give them an opportunity, they will sleep but you take the older fruit flies and keep them awake, and next day, they actually don't fully compensate their sleep loss. Mm. Uh, so this is a phenomena that's already known, happens in humans. So then the question is, can we model it in flies or drosophila, fruit flies or in mice? Then we can go back and see, okay, so what part of the brain is involved? What can we do? for the fruit fly or the mice to remember their sleep dead so that they can go back to sleep mm. and recover. And then what happens when they have this sleep dead, when they cannot sleep enough? So for example, now many labs have shown that in experimental condition, if you take a mouse or a fruit fly that is prone to neurodegenerative disease or dementia and you disturb their sleep for a few days, then that can accelerate the progression to dementia or that can exacerbate the symptoms of dementia. And so that's one part of the story. And then the other part of the story, which is which relates to timing of food, is if you now put these fruit flies or mice that are more prone to dementia, and people, we, we never connect how timing of food connects with dementia, but this is something that actually um, one of the earliest experiment was in fact done in LA, in Los Angeles, mm. in UCLA. Uh, and, At the uh, Buck Institute? Is that, no, actually uh, UCLA. Oh, UCLA. Yeah. UCLA, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, what they did was they took a few mouse strains that are more prone to Huntington disease and they did uh, eight hours time restricted feeding. So that means these mice had to eat only for eight hours and fast for 16 hours. And what they found was surprisingly, the sleep quality of these mice actually improved. Hmm. And um, I remember that experiment because um, uh, uh, the uh, researcher and their team actually asked me, hey, do you think there'll be an effect? And you know, those are the early days, 10 years ago, <laughs> nine years ago. Sure. And I was thinking, huh, this will be an interesting experiment to do. Let's right. try it. <laughs> and <laughs> he tried it and we found that. And then now there are a lot of studies on how time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting actually helps brain health mm. by improving sleep. And uh, this is something that we had never thought. So just by narrowing that window, yeah. not eating late, yeah. right? Which yeah. we were talking about earlier, yeah. which typically is going to mean that if a lot of people are falling asleep at 10, yeah. you're done eating by about six seven, or seven. Yeah. six or seven, because you want those three yeah. hours that are yeah. there. Again, that goes into the all the circadian biology of the organ systems, everything like that. But you're also saying that in addition to not keeping your, you know, your glucose and your insulin high, there is an improvement in the in the brain potentially as well too. Yeah. So this is this uh, also relates to another question that I often get. People say, "Well, I'm healthy. I already have the perfect body composition, and why should I pay attention to when I eat?" <laughs> and my answer is, "Well." We know there are a few things. One is, even though you are healthy, uh, one thing is it, it can actually keep your brain health much better. And in fact, um, when we did our first study on humans, and this was eight years ago, 2015, the paper came out, and there are only eight participants in their study. 
and this was very early days we asked is it feasible for people who have been eating for a long time throughout their life last 15 20 30 40 years can they change that habit because this is a big issue in behavior change sure because we are so married to our old habit means imagine even for coffee means a lot of people they cannot give up coffee it's not that they're born with a coffee in their sippy cup <laughs> we picked it up along the way, but we got so used to coffee that we cannot leave it. So similarly, people who are used to snacking uh, over a long period of time, the question is, can they change behavior? And in that study, there are only eight people. And again, this was funded by an uh, innovation grant from the Salk Institute uh, by a philanthropist. And when these eight people, they stuck to a 10 hour time restricting. So that means they were allowed to eat for 10 hours they self-selected that 10 hours window so that that fits with their lifestyle. And uh, they had to do it only for 18 weeks. And that was the, um, that was the advice that, okay, so we'll do this study for 18 weeks. At the end of 18 weeks, we'll collect some data and then you are free to go. And um, so they were free to go after 18 weeks. They were not even obese people. They're mostly overweight, BMI somewhere between 25 and 30 and their average BMI was 27. And um, they lost a modest amount of weight, 3.5% uh, body weight. We didn't uh, actually measure at that time body composition, whether that is fat loss or muscle loss, because it was a pilot feasibility study. But what was interesting was after a year, we were curious because in many behavior intervention, people actually can't change their behavior forever. It's not sustained. It's not sustained. And in fact, people who do weight loss um, trial means they try to reduce calories, change a different diet plan, or get on a diet, they actually gain back a lot of body weight that they lost. They, they will, they will, many of the benefits actually disappear. So that's why we are curious. We asked them to come back after one year, and then we realized that to our surprise, they actually kept that weight loss. Even though it was a small weight loss, we thought that they would gain back that weight they kept that weight loss. And we are curious, so we asked, we had a very standard questionnaire about their daily habit and other stuff. And what we're surprised to see was they said, all of them, they said it improved their sleep. They were less hungry at bedtime and they're more energetic in the morning. And they said the reason why they continued with the habit was not because of weight, it was because how they felt Mm. how they were feeling that they were at, they were working at a higher uh, performance level throughout the day. And that's the first time. This is where human studies are so important because when we're studying fruit flies and mice, <laughs> we cannot ask the mice and fruit flies, how are you feeling this morning? Right. <laughs> and then the mouse is not giving me high five. <laughs> and, yeah, and with the fruit flies and the mice, they also don't have free will to choose how much food yeah, they yeah. want like human beings do. Yeah. So this was the power of doing a human study yeah. and then following up with the individuals. Yeah. And um, another thing, the difference between human and mice is actually we did an experiment where the mice had to eat uh, nine hours Monday through Friday, <laughs> and then we gave them a cheat day. Uh, weekends were cheat days, so they were allowed to eat whenever they wanted because the food was given 24 seven on the food hopper. And they did not, they actually don't learn the habit. So that means they continue to eat 24 mm. seven in those two days, they over it. The good thing is uh, they still had a lot of health benefits. Mm -hmm. Almost 80% of health benefits. From practicing the time-restricted eating. Just for five days. For five days. In mice. And um, that was actually eye-opening for me because I thought that all these benefits will go away if they cheat for two days. And because, you know, when you when these mice are eating randomly, then they're also disrupting their circadian rhythm and other stuff. And that gave me hope that even humans, hopefully, if they eat, if they try to do time restricting, even for five to six days, that can have health benefits. So that key experiment in mice gave us hope. But in humans, it's very different. When we talk to people who have been trying, and most of our studies are 10 hours time restricting, I'll get back to why 10, not eight, not nine, not six, <laughs> six et cetera. Um, they say that they get food hangover if they eat late. Mm. And this is something that our mice never told me. And then again, a <laughs> lot of people, they actually, 
when I think of hangover, it's uh, it's mostly alcohol, right? But then I came to understand this from people's point of view because they said, well, food hangover is when you eat late and when you wake up in the morning, you feel like the food is still there, it's not digested and you feel groggy and you don't have appetite to eat and your whole morning is spoiled. And it's almost like a hangover from alcohol, but it's from food. And um, we realize there are a lot of people who actually try this. If they eat late into the night, their body revolts and they remind them, hey, these are the immediate bad things that you'll face. Mm. So um, that's something that uh, we realize that in the human studies that time restricting has an impact on sleep. YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. Every single cell in our body has its own 24 hours timetable. That means the cell has to decide, okay, this is the time I have to make energy. This is the time when I have to recycle. This is the time to divide and rejuvenate.